Hello, I'm Anna Della Vega and welcome to Flute Reboot episode five on Idagio Live, the place where classical music happens. This episode is called Vivaldi's Venetian Orphanage. And today we will look at the Red Priest, the first female orchestra and the very origins of the music conservatoire, which is fascinating. Um, we have talked about some flute related going ons in France with Ludi and Rotaterre in Versailles under Louis XIV and Germany with Joachim Kranz and Frederick the Great at Sanssouci at Potsdam. But Italy was of course an epicenter in many ways, um, a pioneer of classical music in the Renaissance and Baroque period. So while there is not so much flute gossip in Italy at this time, I find it really important to turn to Italy for an episode so we have the whole picture of Europe in this period. So Italy was far more focused on stringed instruments. They were responsible for the development of the violin sonata, Monteverdi and Marini. Um, Scalati at this time wrote 555 um, keyboard sonatas. And of course, singing choirs, religious music, and drum roll, of course, Italian opera, the beginnings of Italian opera as we know it. So they were far less into wind instruments. So much so that the one key transverse flute developed in the late 1600s, supposedly in France with Jacques Cotter, which immediately spread to Germany and England, didn't appear in Italy for almost 30 years, somewhere between 1715 and 1720. And even then, um, few people played it. The recorder really held its popularity in Italy against um, the traverso flute for much longer than in other countries. Now, our wonderful friend Kranz from last episode, when he traveled to Italy in 1724, he really was the most renowned wind player in Europe. He reported that he, that he had met only one worthy Italian woodwind player, an oboist called Giuseppe Sammartini. In Naples the following year, Quant was introduced to Alessandro Scalati, this is the father of Domenico, um, who said, you know that I cannot suffer the wind instrumentalists. It is because they all play out of tune. Now, as we have learned in earlier episode, it really is the tuning mechanisms of wind instruments, which are so complex and troublesome in their evolution in history, far more lengthy and complex than with stringed instruments. I mean, um, in fact, it's not even comparable to stringed instruments. The string player determines the pitch of the note entirely himself in any given moment, on why, where he places the finger on the string of which all choices are available. But the wind instrumentalist with keys has it already predetermined and the variables and physics and science of this is never ending. I play um, an Altus, Japanese handmade flute, 1807 heavy wall AL, of which there are only three in the world. And there is a continuing uh, there are continuing changes to, to the scale. Flute makers today still are trying to perfect the placement of keys to form better tuning. So wind instruments throughout history have, have gotten a bad rap for tuning and it seems that the Italians in the Baroque um, were on board with that as well, well, Scarlatti, anyhow. However, Quanz persuaded Scarlatti to accompany him in a performance and Scarlatti was so impressed with his playing that he wrote Quan's six sonatas. So this is a theme I've discussed in, in other episodes, great virtuosos breed an interest from the great composers and with fantastic compositions in turn, this breeds enthusiasm from, orchestra, from audiences and, and creates you know, others wishing to learn the instrument. So really Quan's by being a phenomenal flautist, opened the, the ears and the heart of a fantastic composer who had not yet considered to write for this instrument because he'd not yet heard someone great really playing it, supposedly. And now one can say two of the most significant composers in Italy of the first half of the 1700s was Giuseppe 
Domenico Scalati, son of Alessandro, whinging about the flute tuning earlier, who actually spent much of his life in the services of the Portuguese and Spanish royal families. He is most renowned for his 555 keyboard sonatas. We must note that the term sonata at this time is different um, to how we um, define it today. Scarlatti's sonatas, some of them are like one movement and, and three minutes long, but still 555 is no mean feat. Um, but the most significant figure in the history of Italian Baroque music was without question, Antonio Vivaldi. He wrote more than 500 concertos and more than 50 of them with solo flute parts. Um, now I must highlight an issue that pervaded throughout Europe when we talk about Baroque compositions for flute, because there is a big issue with terminology at this time, because recorders were also still called flutes or flauti, flauto, and, and once the two families separated um, and the transverse flute became an instrument on its own, composers didn't specify in their scores necessarily between traverso flute or the recorder because it really was in a, in a transition period. So it's quite hard to say um, exactly um, which instrument it's intended for. Now, in the case of Vivaldi, it may have been intentional because Italy was quite slow to accept the tra transverse flute. Um, and at this time, um, it was really the amateurs were, it was the pop, the recorder was popular still amongst amateurs um, and the professionals were turning now to the transverse flute. So perhaps he was leaving the option open. We will not know. Um, now, Vivaldi was born in 1678. Not much is known of his musical training, although his father was a highly regarded violinist and definitely taught him the violin. He then started um, the organ and theoretical studies. And in 1703, at the age of 25, he was ordained. So he committed himself to a life in the church. Now, Vivaldi was apparently a rather quirky character and had a big, crazy shock of like messy red hair and he subsequently became known as the Red Priest. Now, it's said he was not entirely cut out for a life in the church, to say the least, and the story goes that while giving mass early in his priestly career, um, a musical idea came to his mind and he left the altar mid-sentence, went backstage, whatever, yeah, yeah um, and... To, uh, to write out this theme and then sometime later comes back to the altar to finish mass. Now this didn't exactly fly with the Venetian religious inquisition and that was of course the last time he gave mass. So after one year in the job he was ditched um, but a perfect and fascinating solution for the red composer priest was to come. Vivaldi began his association with the Ospedale della Pieta. This was an orphanage largely for the illegitimate daughters of Venetian noblemen and was very well financed by its anonymous benefactors. Now, there were, there were four of these in Venice at the time. If you imagine how many illegitimate children of the nobility that means, the Italians were clearly rather busy. Um, the illegitimate sons of the noblemen lived separately and learned a trade, but the girls studied music full time. And this, I will explain later, is the very foundation of the conservatoire, which is now the, the worldwide standard for learning, of course, music anywhere. So this, this was incredible. The Pieta offered a creative outlet for women at a time when professional opportunities for female musicians or women, women in any field were a really long way off. This is the early 1700s and these girls were considered, um, you know, the, from this amazing environment and training to be among the most accomplished performers of their time in Europe and people travelled far and wide to hear them perform. 
which was, I will add, behind metal grates where you could just peep through. Um, uh, if lucky, the girls could end up marrying back into nobility. Um, now, because they were constantly in need of new music, the bulk of Vivaldi's output, including almost 500 concertos, 46 symphonias, 73 sonatas, chamber music, and on and on and on, was likely written for these highly skilled orphanage girls. And, you know, we wonder why did Schubert write 600 songs? Why did Scarlatti write 555 keyboard sonatas? Um, and we always wonder why did Vivaldi write so many concertos? Well, this is certainly one of the main contributing factors. Um, Vivaldi's role at the Pieta was multifaceted, to say the least. He was um, teacher, orchestra manager, um, composer, violinist, purchaser of instruments. And as the Pieta had an orchestra of 30 to 40 girls, which is amazing. I mean, um, it's enormous. Louis XIV at Versailles had 24 strings. Um, he had choruses and these amazing soloists, all female, at his disposal. So Vivaldi really had a sort of musical laboratory of extensive resources paid for mainly by the guilty dads who had accidentally had these children. Um, and you can imagine the amount of money a music school of this size would have needed at that time is, is, is staggering. This, this is before photocopying, of course. All the music was copied by hand, the cost of instruments and repairs and the cost of um, acquiring music from other countries. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, now, Vivaldi's leadership had its troubles, apparently. He, he was supposedly rather strong-willed, unpredictable, unpredictable, volatile, and there's an implication that there was some suspect um, relationships with some of the girls. Um, the board of directors um, actually voted him out um, in 1709, and he was he d was not there for two years. But then they realised that um, how much they needed him, and he was reinstated like to top dog maestro de concerti, and and that was it. Um, and he stayed there for a very long time. Um, now to the flute. The orphanage's records show that Vivaldi was paid for 140 concertos between 1723 and 1733, so in a span of 10 years. Vivaldi's six flute concertos, for which we are enormously grateful because they're beautiful, they were written in 1728, so smack bang in the middle of these years. And so it is certainly assumed that they were part of the works written for the girls during this time. So now I am going to play you an example of these concertos. Um, La Notte. Okay. So that was um, La Notte, um, Emmanuel Payud and the Berlin Philharmonic. So the concerto had them on their toes. I mean, it's phenomenal. You can see the, um, the virtuosity in these pieces to think that these girls who, who were playing a one-keyed, six-hold transverse flute, um, which is far more difficult to play and to rip up and down as the modern flute. I mean, their, their technical skills, their abilities must have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, now, 
with Vivaldi, there has been a lot of jokes throughout time about self-borrowing um, within or between his concertos. And there's the old saying that Vivaldi wrote the same concerto hundreds of times. Though the joke is not accurate, there is some sense to where it may have come from. Um, after a lot of, of research, it's it really is generally agreed um, among many musicologists as, musicologists that the, that really Vivaldi's style is so markedly individual and so consistent within his total output that that one may easily perceive repetition where it does not um, actually exist. Now Vivaldi was appreciated far and wide. At the height of his career, he received commissions from Europe, nobility and, and royalty, particularly from Emperor Charles VI who took um, a really big shine to him and actually gave him the title of knight and invited him to Vienna. Like many composers um, of that time, Vivaldi had financial difficulties in, in his later years and he sold off a large number of his manuscripts um, at small prices to pay for this migration to Vienna, which was likely because of the interest that Emperor Charles VI had shown in him. However, soon after he arrived in Vienna, Charles VI died, which left him without any um, royal protection or the possibility of a job. Sadly, soon after he, he became rather impoverished and he himself died um, in July, 1741. On a lighter note, really, this man can be said to be the fundamental figure in creating the music conservatorium. Have you ever thought why or where the word conservatorium comes from? Conservatoire, conservatory. An orphan was called a conservati, which means the saved. Orphanages were called conservatori. And the Pieta was one of the very first orphanages to teach music to the girls at such a high level and become so renowned as a music institution. And that is the mothership of the modern day conservatorium, a home for conservati, the conservatory um, learning music at this unbelievable level. Now, um, it must be added that before the Venetian orphanages, there were schools that taught music, but they were for boys, castrati, and they were all attached to the church to train for singing, to be in choirs and, and, and to assist mass. So the, that these were all female and secular makes it really fascinating. And, and this really gave the basis for the conservatorium um, as we know it. And that is the story of our red priest. Um, so next week, we stay in Austria for episode six for the Mozart myth. Legend tells us that Mozart hated the flute. But history tells us he was chasing girls. Thank you for listening um, to Adagio Live. I am Anna Della Vega. And